May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. The Feast of Christ the King, which we observe today, is not an ancient feast. It was established by Pope Pius XI in 1925. And it's been observed in our church since on the last Sunday before Advent since 1970. But it's not listed as a major feast in the prayer book. The prayer book simply calls this day the last Sunday after Pentecost. But that raises an interesting question. What does it mean to call Jesus King today? Why do we sing hymns filled with imagery such as crown him with many crowns we just sang, or imagine Jesus as literally enthroned wearing not one, but three crowns. You can find him in the great Ghent altarpiece if you want to go there. So, what is a king anyway? Well, it depends on when you're asking the question. Pre-modern kings and queens were those persons designated to rule over others. The king had the power to make final judgments for his subjects and commanded the obedience of his subjects to those judgments or else. Being a king was a status into which you were born, something you inherited on the death of your predecessor. It's not an office you could run for like president. When the king dies, the cry is, the king is dead, long live the king. There's a gentle reminder of what it means to be the king in King Henry V by Shakespeare. There's a marvelous intimate scene with the king and Catherine, his future bride and queen, and Catherine is fussing. Should we be alone together, a woman and a man, before we're married? Henry sets her straight. He says, Dear Kate, you and I cannot be confined within the weak list of a country's fashion. We are the makers of manners, Kate. In other words, if the king says it, that's the way it is. But if there are ancient writings which commemorate the wisdom, benevolence, or success of kings in war, there are certainly ancient testimonies of concern about the title king. In ancient Israel, before David was anointed king by Samuel, no Israelite dared to claim the title Melech, which is Hebrew for king. They thought that only God should be called king. And in ancient Rome, because of a long tradition of hostility to the Etruscan kings who had ruled over the Romans, the first Caesars were very careful not to use the word rex or king. Julius Caesar called himself dictator. Yes, you're right. That's where you got the word dictator. And the others called themselves imperator. Translation. Generalissimo. Head cheese of the army. Today, the question might be different. If you observe kings and queens today, while they still may be called sovereign or addressed as majesty, or wear fancy clothes when they're doing their official job, they clearly no longer possess the ancient prerogatives attributed to their predecessors. With the exception of the United Kingdom, no contemporary reigning king or queen in Europe ever wears a crown. There isn't even a coronation because coronations are expensive. And besides, if you have them, it reminds everybody of an ancient world where kings were here and everyone else was down here. To be a king today, one of the questions is, are you going to ride in a carriage or take a bicycle to the palace? To be a king or queen today is to be an expert in pretending, in seeming. Everybody knows the king or queen doesn't have any of that awful majesty of their ancestors. But nostalgia for those good old days when the Netherlands ruled over part of the world or British Empire was all over the place, that nostalgia drives people to pretend the current occupant of the throne is in fact like that. 
So, what does it mean to call Jesus the King today? Our readings from 2 Samuel and John 18 give us clues. The place to begin is to consider Jesus' reply to Pilate in today's Gospel. Pilate wants to know if Jesus is King of the Jews. Now, Pilate is a typical administrator. He wants to put everything in tidy boxes. King, not king. Jesus doesn't play his game. He says, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate, frustrated, asks him again, So, are you a king or what? Jesus answers, You say that I am king, but for this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth hears my voice. The Jesus who speaks in John's Gospel rejects completely the idea of a worldly kingdom. A kingdom, you know, based on tax collectors, magistrates, soldiers, executioners, and other enforcers. Jesus says, instead, he came into the world to testify to the truth. What is that? What is the truth he's talking about? It is a truth persistently ignored, despised, and rejected in his lifetime, and a truth still ignored, despised, and rejected by those who believe that the only reality worth acknowledging is power. The power to coerce others, whether through their greed for gain and status or through fear of pain and death. The kind of power that uses violent force against the world's violence. The ignored, despised truth is not something made up to manipulate others. It is the servant truth of God's incarnation, of God's entry into the living flesh of the world as a vulnerable infant. In Jesus the Christ, God, the creator of the universe, sets aside all those attributes of majesty and power to be born in the most vulnerable and challenging situation. And the passage from Samuel gives us a second clue. It brings to mind King David. Having read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we know that those Gospels say Jesus is a descendant of David. He is in the royal line. And who was David? Well, he was a king who was a warrior, but also a poet. That's a very rare combination. People who rule others usually don't have a lot of time for poetry or for the arts, unless, of course, the poem praises them or the painting makes them look bigger than life. But David was both. And David was an incredibly divided, complex person. On the one hand, as our reading says, he wanted to be one who rules over people justly, ruling in the fear of God like the light of morning. On the other hand, he was a man driven by desires, desires for women, desires for control, desires to be in charge. But God made flesh in Jesus is a poet, but not like David, much less a ruler like Caesar. Many years ago, Alfred North Whitehead made a very wise comment about Caesar. He wrote, When the Western world accepted Christianity, Caesar conquered, and the received text of Western theology was edited by Caesar's lawyers. Caesar conquered. The brief Galilean vision of humility flickered through the ages, uncertainly. But the deeper idolatry of fashioning God in the image of the Egyptian, Persian, or Roman rulers 
was retained. The church gave unto God attributes which belong to Caesar. But there is, he said, in the Galilean origin of Christianity, yet another suggestion, one which does not fit in very well. It does not emphasize the ruling Caesar, the ruthless moralist, or the unmoved mover. It dwells upon the tender elements in the world, which slowly and in quietness operate by love. Love neither rules nor is it unmoved. It's also a little oblivious as to morals. It does not look to the future, but finds its own reward in the present. And then later, in one of his most memorable writings, Whitehead adds, God is the poet of the world with tender patience, leading it by his vision of truth, beauty, and goodness. Jesus is both king and poet in this sense. Think about it. The Jesus who speaks to us in the parables of Mark, Matthew, and Luke speaks words of poetry because that's what the parables are. In the parables, ordinary things in everyday life, ordinary events, or very small things like mustard seeds become vehicles through which his hearers are given glimpses of the kingdom of God. That's what poets do, you know. Poets take ordinary occasions, small things seen or heard, and shape them into words which can transform us if we read Mark and inwardly digest them. The Jesus who speaks in John's Gospel acts poetically. Jesus' signs manifest the rule of God on earth. The signs are miraculous, even though his observers don't always get it. He changes water into wine at Cana of Galilee. He raises Lazarus from the dead. He heals the sick and gives sight to the blind. All of these are ways which communicate the fact that the world can be transformed in ways no one expected. The world can be transformed in such a way that those folks rejected as outcasts or unclean are welcomed into the family of God. And think how Jesus reacts to those who are his critics and accusers. Jesus faces those who reject him or deny him, not with the king's rage, or demand for obedience, but instead with a depth of care for that angry, cynical, unbelieving other. It's a care that refuses to let the other go. It's a care that refuses anger, speaking instead the liberating word which has a capacity to free those ranged against him from their anger, their fear, their resentment. Jesus is a king who cares for, gives himself to free his subjects from their burdens. The kingship of Christ today has nothing to do with those pretended shadows of ancient majesty we see in modern kings and queens. The kingship of Christ today combines his transformational poetry, which can turn the heart and mind away from preoccupation with chaos in the world, with, with acting in his name, inviting others into his kingdom of love, compassion, and care to the different other. We're invited to walk with him, taking with us those who are wounded, those who are forgotten, those who are ignored on the king's highway. Let's walk with him. Amen. Amen.